Um, and with that, I will just give it to Marina. Uh, and yeah, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Maha. Um, am I coming through okay? Am I loud and clear? Or clear yes, you sound great. I'm using a new device, so I had to test it. Thank you, Maha, for this very generous introduction. It is a pleasure. I thank the UNR Postdoctoral Student Association um, to, for, for putting this event on, and especially you, Maha, I know that you put in so, so much work into this. And thank you all for being here, friends and family and colleagues. This is wonderful. Thank you for, for a beautiful afternoon. So I'm going to share my screen in the hope that that is not going to interfere uh, with the program. on the bottom here and if I share my we don't need to do that we need to start the presentation and that doesn't matter it starts with the book all right so let, Kevin let me ask you can can you respond viva voce <laughs> can you hear me yeah you sound good. looks good good okay excellent So as I mentioned in the abstract for this talk, I specialize in ancient Greek philosophy, politics, history, and literature. I also work in 19th century German philosophy. There are very strong parallels and relationships between ancient Greek and 19th century German thought because there was a kind of revival of ancient Greek thinking in the German academe at that time. Insofar as the ancient Greek philosophy is concerned, there are two main directions that I currently pursue in my research. First, I aim to decolonize the ancient Greeks, so to speak. And secondly, I am interested in ancient Greek comedy. I will speak briefly about the decolonization and then focus largely on comedy and especially its significance for political philosophy. There are ingrained interpretations of ancient Greek thinkers, which regrettably have become standard. For example, one common view is that ancient Greece had this perfect democratic political arrangement, which is a sort of ideal that we now hold out for ourselves and wish to live up to. But nothing could be further from the truth. Although it is the case indeed that ancient Greeks institutionalized direct democratic process, nonetheless, democracy itself is in fact more properly a Phoenician idea. And so you're looking here at a place that I've been to that is very dear to my heart, uh, Tolopotami village in Chios on an island of Chios in Greece. And just to give us geographic location, uh, Chios is right here across from Turkey. And so with, this is where those tablets with Phoenician laws indicating a democratic arrangement were found and they predate what we normally think of as Athenian Attic, uh, democratic constitution and the sets of laws. And so ancient Phoenicians then, this is the area of uh, ancient Phoenicia, which is present day Lebanon. Ancient Phoenicians, they were Semitic peoples and they were masterful seafarers. So it's no wonder that their ideas spread at least as far as Greece. And so not the Greeks, but the Phoenicians were the first to try out democratic arrangements in the city states. The Greeks appropriated those arrangements, but did not necessarily invent them. Moreover, once democracy took root in Attica, at the time that one of the most well-known Athenian statesmen, Pericles, had his turn at running the polis or the Athenian city-state. It's simply a Greek name for city or polis. Democracy at that time, though, was anything but ideal. There were plentiful political machinations. There was corruption in the courts and of the judicial process. There were aristocratic and oligarchic factions that vied for power in the polis, in the city-state, and that often supported nothing short of tyranny to get their way with the hoi polloi or with a democratic majority. All the while, the people were being sweet talked and swindled by very well-trained, persuasive, but often utterly unprincipled rhetoricians 
we can call those persuasive speakers opinion shapers to bring this idea a little bit closer to our own day and age. This is hardly a picture of an ideal democratic state. If anything, Athenian politics during the golden age of Greece in fifth and fourth centuries BCE was rather closer to our own political predicament. All the same, ancient Greece gave to the world extraordinary wealth of human achievement. From admirable military commanders and ingenious tactics, to stunning architecture and art, to marvelous literature and most sublime philosophy. Thus it is true that without ancient Greece, much of Western philosophy, arts, religion, and science would have been impossible. But it is not true that ancient Greece was a monocultural place or that its history seamlessly connects up with European and Western values. I see my research in ancient Greek philosophy, history, and drama as an attempt to learn from the ancient Greek texts and ideas how to espy or evince these and other possible dissonances or incongruous opinions and views that we may hold, be they historical, political, religious, or personal. My latest interest is ancient Greek comedy. Comedy, and especially philosophical comedy, is very well positioned to reveal to us those things about ourselves which we least want to accept or which we simply do not have the capacity to realize about ourselves on our own. I would like to take this opportunity to let you know about my book. In the book, I carry out a study of ancient Greek political comedy and its value for philosophy. The title is Plato and Aristophanes and the subscript there, Comedy, Politics and the Pursuit of a Just Life. It is coming out with Northwestern University Press and available with them, but also on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. And if you would like to purchase it now, there's a 25% discount. The discount code is there for you on the bottom, NUP 2021. <laughs> and that's it for the infomercial. In the book then, I argue that first we need to realize that Plato's dialogues are not treatises written from the first person. Plato, of course, is the author, there's no question, but we never hear his voice, or better, we never hear Plato speak in the first person. In other words, there is no dialogue where Plato says, I, Plato, myself, believe X, and so should you. That never happens. They are not, the dialogues, they're not expounding theories or professing beliefs that Plato may have held. And this might sound strange to us, but Plato's dialogical philosophizing is more akin to a theatrical play or maybe even a novel. And this is another provocation that I offer to you. What is philosophy? Is it not this very serious, highly speculative undertaking? What does it mean that Plato wrote dialogues which include drama, comedy that is, and tragedy, but also sophistry and even myth? How are all of these things philosophy? Here's an analogy to help us get into the right mindset. We would be entirely remiss to say that just because Leo Tolstoy wrote War and Peace, he, as the author, shares some beliefs that Pierre Bezukhov or Natasha Rostova may hold. Likewise, just because Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, or so we think, <laughs> this hardly means that he, Shakespeare, as the author, uses Hamlet as his own mouthpiece or as a literary vehicle to relate his own ideas about life and its meaning. Therefore, whatever meaning we seek to glean from a Shakespearean play, for example, we have to do so by attending to a number of factors or elements. In addition to the words spoken by the characters in the play, there is also a dramatic context. The same holds true for Plato. In addition to anything that any biological characters do or say, there is also the drama of the dialogue. This means that there are multiple characters who are often based on historical individuals. And there are also interactions, sometimes play playful, sometimes ironic, but at other times heated and opinionated. Those encounters that happen between the dialogical characters. 
And thus, we have to look at the historical setting of the dialogue. We have to think about the context in which the speeches take place, be it comedy, tragedy, science, religion, and so on. We also have to take seriously not only the so-called rational arguments or logoi in the Greek, here for you on the screen, but also we have to look at very carefully when we read Plato, the many more fanciful stories or muthoi in the Greek, these mythical tales that dialogical characters exchange with recall all of this is philosophy now moreover we have to consider the difference between what is being said and what is being done or the difference between the dialogical speeches and actions that these same speeches relate to us if we take away if we excise any of these elements and set them aside as unimportant as irrelevant we then would do irreparable damage to the text and foreclose any genuine encounter with Plato's philosophizing. I now would like to turn to a concrete passage from the dialogue and apply my method of interpretation to it. I will show two things. First, I will explain how the passage is usually interpreted and what sort of a standard view of the meaning of the dialogue emerges on the basis of such a common reading. And then, I will underscore a comedic or an ironic element that the passage contains and will explain why being attentive to these comedic undertones reverses the initial meaning of the passage. This analysis that I will offer now does not appear in my forthcoming book, but it is something I discuss in a paper that will soon be published with a scholarly philosophy journal. So the dialogue in question now Plato's Phaedo is usually presented as a dialogue that concerns death and the afterlife. It is also a text where the interlocutors spend a long time conversing about the soul and more specifically the fate of the soul after the death of the body. Of course, uh, the image is a very famous painting of Socrates in prison, awaiting his execution, indeed, accepting here the potion that kills him. Strange though it may be, most interpreters, even now, millennia later, do not bother to question this premise. What in the world does it mean to say that the death of the body is somehow independent of what happens to the soul? It is a very odd thing to say, namely that there is some individual soul and that moreover, it is utterly other than the body. And that furthermore, the two, the soul and the body are somehow separable. Despite its stated interest in the matters of death and afterlife, the Phaedo after all is the dialogue that ends with Socrates' death. Discussions in this dialogue are politically framed the name itself, Phaedo, belongs to the narrator of this dialogue and to a historical person who was enslaved. Socrates bought Phaedo out of slavery, thus granting him freedom. Here, in the person of the main interlocutor of the Phaedo, political concerns are alive. Furthermore, the dialogue is framed by a certain entwinement of politics and religion. Shortly before the events in the Phaedo take place, a sacred mission sails to Delos. During the voyage of the ship, which commemorates Athenians' liberation from an awful tribute to a cannibalistic beast, the Minotaur. During this time that the ship sails, no one may be put to death by the city of Athens. And then the winsome Minotaur for you here is on the screen. Athens must be kept pure to observe this religious rite which has roots in a political enmity between the ruling elites of ancient Athens and Crete. However, when the ship returns, Socrates will be put to death all the same. This man who fought so valiantly to protect Athens and who devoted his life to knowledge, the kind of knowledge without which communal justice is unthinkable, Socrates will be put to death at the end of the Phaedo. For all of Socrates' service to the city of Athens, 
and his battlefield valor in the Peloponnesian War notwithstanding. Enough Athenians decide that he is unfit and that he is unworthy of staying alive. Here then, at the very start of Plato's Phaedo, the question of political justice looms large. What does it tell us about the integrity of the Athenians' intentions? They keep the polis, the city, clean from pollution by observing this religious ritual, but they do not shy away from taking a life of the person who dedicated his own life to the well-being of their city. Is there not a cognitive dissonance in this? Athenians uphold a religious prescription, but the spirit of religion, the originary ground of spirituality, which is the life of a human being, this Athenians are not afraid to trample down. How often do we see this very duplicity in the hearts and minds of our own contemporaries? Are there no political or social leaders today who may well mouth religious slogans that sound right and sound good? while they're doing awful harm to real, living, breathing persons, are we ourselves completely free from such and other cognitive dissonances? It is then in this context that the many conversations in the Phaedo set sail. I propose to you that given this opening frame, any reading of the Phaedo, which claims that philosophy aims at attaining some pure, otherworldly afterlife by separating the body from the soul or the ideal and idealized version of a human person from her life, from her historical lived existence, any such reading completely misses, completely misses the philosophical import of the Phaedo. And yet, in the Phaedo, there are indeed ceaseless speeches about the post-mortem and also about the prenatal existence of the soul and the various ways in which the soul can even be trained to flee the body during one's life. How else are we supposed to understand then the dialogue's preoccupation with death, afterlife, purity, and the separation of the soul from the body? These separations that the dialogical speeches are performing right at the start of the Phaedo, for example, the separations between pleasure and pain, between purity and contagion or profanation, and especially between muthoi, myths, mythical tales, and logoi, or the rational accounts, all these separations set the conceptual stage for one of the conclusions which mark not Socrates, but his interlocutors, Simeus and Cades, wish him to argue for and to establish. This conclusion claims that the soul is that undying part that takes off and the soul goes away and remains undestroyed, having gotten out of death's way. To reach this conclusion, many separations have to be carried out in the speeches that Socrates makes throughout the entire dialogue. They point out the sorts of things that a human being must be doing in order to ensure that her soul becomes immortal. However, the many different separations that the dialogue overtly carries out, in fact, do not hold up if we examine them with close scrutiny. And so now I will offer an example that will show what I mean when I say that the dialogical speeches can say one thing, but that these very same speeches can do, act out or perform something else, something completely different. For example, the dialogical speeches may overtly state that the soul and the body are separable, or more to the point, that the philosophers are willing and ever ready to die, and that philosophy is a practice of dying and being dead. This may be said, but at the level of the dialogical action, all of these recommendations or presuppositions are utterly undone. Now to the passage. And we will carry on a little bit longer before we take a look at the video. In this passage that I am showing to you right now, Socrates notices that Crito, his friend of many years, of course, the passage is from the Phaedo, that Crito has something to report. And Socrates then asks Crito to speak up. And Crito says the following, and I am simply reading. What else but this, Socrates, that for a long time now, the fellow who's to give you your potion has been telling me that I should warn you 
to converse as little as possible. It's like the movie Chinatown, <laughs> do as little as possible. He says, people who do a lot of conversing get all heated up and that one must not interfere in any such way with the potion. Crito continues and reports that the jailer tells him that if that does happen, if people speak a lot, sometimes those who do this sort of thing must be compelled to drink the potion twice and even three times. Socrates responds, let him be. Just have him prepare his potion and be ready to give it twice, and if he must, even three times. What is happening here? On the surface of the dialogical conversations, we have this idea that if one is of a sound mind and if one is philosophical, then it is desirable for such a person to follow Socrates as quickly as possible into the netherworld. In other words, if one is philosophical and prudent, one should be ready, willing, and even eager to die. And this is what Socrates' logoi or speeches say. Now, what about the dramata in the Greek, the action of the dialogue? What about the argument in the dramatic action? Socrates' attitude and especially his actions, irrespective of Crito's warning here, undo or at least severely undermine this idea, which is a common interpretation, one of the common interpretations of the Phaedo, the idea that philosophers must be somehow intimately connected with, familiar with death, and maybe even willing to die. Crito says, the potion, the potion master, he warns you, Socrates, that if you go on speaking, it will take a lot of this potion to take your life. But this also means that if Socrates continues to make these very speeches about prudent philosophers who should welcome death readily instead of prolonging their lives, then Socrates will not die quickly. You see the contradiction. Socrates acknowledges this fact and says, fine, and he goes on speaking. Right? So this performative contradiction between what is being said and what is being done in the dialogue. And now I would like, Maha, to turn to you, if you could screen that scene for us. Uh, stop share from the office and then we'll have just a couple more minutes of the presentation will be done after the office scene I just want to with the scene I want to exemplify what do I mean by a contradiction between what is being done what is being said can you see my um or Dwight's face I definitely can here's Dwight okay <laughs> all right I'm not sure I'm sharing sound yeah Perfect, Maha, thank you. This is great. Okay, all right. So, I mean, this is this is happening, right? <laughs> Stay calm! <laughs> so, there's, there's a clear kind of, you're saying one thing, but you're doing the precise opposite, which is what's happening in this passage that, that I presented for us and that I discussed and outlined. So, well, because while Socrates is making these speeches, you see, right? Insofar as he is making them, yeah, he was told, stop speaking. You keep on speaking, you heat it up, and they will have to give you your potion, your pharmacon, maybe even three times. And he says, wonderful, and he goes on speaking. <laughs> right? He goes on speaking about how it's important for philosophers to hurry up already and die. If you are smart, prudent, and philosophical, you should be fine with death. He says that. But while he's saying that, he's staying alive. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant, actually. Right? So in his actions, Socrates, in fact, insofar as the dialogical drama is concerned, is prolonging his life. That's what, that's what he's doing philosophically. And the dialogical drama or actions prove this. What Socrates cares about, you see, is not showing that philosophizing is dying and being dead. The two, death and philosophy, that is, are identified at the surface of the dialogical speeches. But this identity of philosophy and or even as death is undone in the dialogical action, and I really have just a couple more paragraphs. Therefore, we have in the action of the dialogue a clear counter-argument in the action. We have a counter-argument and then overturning of the surface or overt meaning of the dialogical speeches. Here we have an excellent example of the double nature of Plato's writing, which can both say and unsay one and the same thing in the self-same line give it to you and take it away same language <laughs> but what 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 do plato's comedy and socrates's irony mean for politics and what do they mean for us 
My entire book seeks to answer this very question. Here, I will only say that there are three things, minimally, <laughs> that Plato's comedy accomplishes. First, Plato's comedy undermines the prescriptive and especially the dogmatic tenor of the dialogues, thus opening up the possibility for us to rethink the various political and ethical frameworks that arise from the dialogues. We know that Plato's dialogues, <laughs> these cardinal texts for political theory, ethics, especially, right? And, and so my claim is that if we pay attention to Plato's comedy, we begin to shake up those theories that have been pulled off or created on the basis of Plato's text. Second, Plato's comedy teaches us to read Plato with great care, to read and to reread, paying especially close attention to the way in which the comedic elements refract and change the overt meaning of the text. Third, Plato's comedy invites us to take a more light-hearted attitude toward our own ingrained views, prejudices, and even ideals. It is important that laughing with Plato, we also laugh at ourselves, because through this laughter, we move a little bit closer to better knowing ourselves. And thank you very much <laughs> for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Marina Maran. This was a very interesting presentation. Thank you.